Welcome. In this video, we will demonstrate why the spread of data is important, particularly with respect to understanding how consistent or variable the population data values might be. We will motivate our understanding of how to measure spread by using a milepost analogy. And we will formally introduce the standard deviation formulas along with a few other less commonly used measures of spread. Let's recall the purpose of a GFDT, a grouped frequency distribution table, or of a histogram, which is just the bar graph used to represent a GFDT. There are numerous purposes for these plots, including visualizing the shape of the data, more specifically, how exactly is the data distributed along the number line over the range of the data, locating the center of the distribution, or even just where the data is located as a whole, measuring and depicting the spread of the distribution, the spread of the data, and then once we have these locations and measures, we can start to talk about the position of distinct data points within the data set relative to the other points in the entirety of the data set. Before I proceed, there is a brief comment I want to share about my approach to teaching statistics. The traditional approach found in many modern statistics textbooks is to introduce a collection of statistics and tools to measure the center of the data, such as the mean, median, mode, maybe even the mid-range or geometric mean in some cases. Next, you move to different measures of spread, such as the standard deviation, the range, or the interquartile range. And then finally, you move to measures of position, like the z-score and general quantiles. While I won't elaborate here why I do not prefer this approach, I will simply say that this isn't really how statisticians and data scientists think about or work with data in the real world. In reality, the decision on how to describe the data depends more on the shape of the distribution of the data. For example, for data sets that are normal or nearly normal, then there is a benefit to measuring the center with the mean and measuring the spread with the standard deviation. In turn, it makes sense to reference the position of values in the data set with the z-score or the standardized score, but we'll have more to say on this shortly. Then, in those cases where you don't really have bell-shaped distributions, there is another set of measures that we can use. These measures naturally are related to the positioning of all of the data when sorted in order. These are the median, to measure the center of the data, and the quartiles, to give a broader picture of how the data might be spread out, for example, intervals over which you might find large chunks of the data. And then there are always other measures that are available to measure different aspects of center or spread or other attributes of the shape of the distribution, such as skewness or flatness versus peakedness, and we can explore these at a later time. The key is that I will focus on measuring center, spread, and position for bell-shaped distributions first, and then for general distributions second. Let's begin to set the statistical stage to help us understand why measures of spread can be useful in our statistical analyses. Say we have two groups of students, and the average exam scores for each group are group 1 with a mean of 85.94, and group 2 with a mean of 73.97. If we are comparing the exam performances for the two groups, the first question we would be inclined to ask is, do the groups have the same mean? Well, the means clearly are not the same number, 85.94 does not equal 73.97, so no, the groups do not have the same mean. Okay, maybe the better question would be how far apart are the group means? Again, the obvious answer is the correct answer here. The difference in the two means is 11.97, m sub 1 minus m sub 2. But this doesn't really help much, does it? We know how far apart the means are, but we have no idea of the practical meaning of this difference. In other words, we don't know if 11.97 is a big or a small difference. So the real question we want to try to answer is this. Is this a big enough difference between the group means to have any practical importance? Or does the size of the difference actually mean anything when comparing the two groups? As we progress, we will see that a measure of the spread is one tool we have available to us as statisticians and data scientists to help us begin to answer a question like this. As seen in a previous demonstration, one way that we can assess the size of the difference between two group means is to run a simulation where we dump the data from both groups into one big pot and then we randomly pick the values from the pot for each of the two groups. Well, it would be more like picking the values for the first group and then every value not picked ends up in the second group. Here are some data on the heights of saplings. The first group is the control group, and the trees in this sample 
you are not exposed to any fertilizer. The second group is the treatment group, and these trees did receive the fertilizer. Here we have the heights of the trees after a given period of time measured in centimeters. We see that the mean height for the first group is 38.47 centimeters, and the mean height for the second group was 51.21 centimeters. Thus, the fertilized trees were on average 12.74 centimeters taller. Again, we don't know if that value of 12 and 3 quarters of a centimeter is a meaningful difference, so we run our simulation. We do this by imagining that we are putting all of our data values in one big bucket, shuffling, and then drawing 10 values for the first group, and the remaining values go in the second group. Here is the result of one such random shuffling. Again, we chose 10 values at random from all the values, and that becomes our quote-unquote control group, i.e. our simulated control group. The remaining values become the quote-unquote treatment group. For these two newly shuffled data sets, we can calculate their means, 45.79 and 43.89, and we get a difference of negative 1.9 centimeters. In this run of the simulation, it appears the untreated trees were larger on average. The idea here is to use random chance to our benefit. If we just shuffle the data, then there is no reason the groups should be different. Their group means won't be exactly the same each time, but we would expect, because of chance, they wouldn't be too far off from each other either. So, we run the simulation 10,000 times. We randomly shuffle the data into two groups, calculate the mean difference for the groups, and then we did it again and again and again. That's the simulation part. Now we see how spread out the mean differences might be just because of chance. And this spread in the data of random draws allows us to better assess if our original observed difference of 12.74 centimeters is big enough to be noteworthy. Again, by doing this simulation, we can get a sense of how big a difference we might observe between the group means just by random chance. And the range of usual values we might observe by random chance is directly related to how spread out this data of simulated differences is. In this case, most of the group differences look to be between negative 10 and 10 by random chance. While it is not impossible to see a group difference as large as ours, 12.74 centimeters, it doesn't happen very often. This suggests something other than random chance is the cause for the difference in the observed average heights for our treated and untreated saplings. We will explore this idea further in future lessons. Before we progress too much further with how we measure spread, let's clarify what our goal actually is. It seems as though we want to compare two or more groups, but this begs a question. Compare them on what? Well, we could compare some measure of center for both groups, the quote-unquote average, if we wish to speak in general terms. But even here, we need to elaborate. Why do we want to compare the average of two groups? In most cases, we are trying to actually compare two or more populations. In other words, is the average of one population bigger or smaller or just generally different from another population? This is the larger goal that we are usually working toward. Unfortunately, it often is too costly or unfeasible or even impossible to collect the data from two populations. So we settle for the next best thing. The next best thing is to draw a sample from each population and then compare the samples. To clarify, we are often comparing two samples with the intent to compare two populations. And if there is a difference in the samples, we would like to infer that there would be a corresponding difference in the population. But to make a claim like this, we need to have an understanding of how the data is spread out. The amount of spread that naturally occurs in the data set helps us decide if the distance between group averages is small, moderate, large, or extremely large. And this is why we will now develop a measure of spread. Why measure spread? Let's keep this last thought in mind. If I'm trying to compare two samples with the hope that I can generalize that observation to the populations, then there is indeed something to be gained by looking at the spread of the data in the samples. Simply put, Less spread in the data suggests a higher degree of consistency, both in the data and then extended to the population. The more consistent the sample data, the stronger our belief that the sample mirrors the population. Let's clarify this concept with a couple of examples. Here's a simulated data set for exam scores from two groups of students, juniors and seniors. 
we can see that the average for the juniors is 74 points, which is two points below the average for the seniors, 76 points. The difference between the averages is two points. Again, we want to know if the difference of two points means that seniors in general do better on average than juniors. This last statement being about the populations of all seniors and all juniors. Whereas our difference here was observed only for a sample of juniors and a sample of seniors. Let's look at the data a little more extensively. Here's the back-to-back -back expanded stem and leaf plot for the actual set of values, which comparably gives more information than the summary statistics provided here on the left. Again, our focus is on the question as to whether this difference of two points is a meaningful difference or not. Generally speaking, the data sets for both groups appear to have similar shapes, and the range for each data set is about the same. And based on the peaks and bell shape of the data sets, it seems reasonable to assert that the two data sets have about the same amount of spread. In fact, the spread, measured by this standard deviation thing which we haven't yet defined or introduced, is indeed about the same value for each group, 9.6 and 11.9, both numbers close to about 10.5-ish. When we note that the distributions have about the same amount of spread, and that the distributions look to be centered about the same general area, if not the same exact number, and that the medians are all also pretty close, actually they are both 75, taken all together, one might conclude that the mean difference of two points does not appear to be a meaningfully large enough difference to suggest that the two groups are actually that far apart. One tool we will use in the future is to assess the size of the difference compared to the standard deviation. And we note here that the difference is less than one-fifth of the average standard deviation between the two groups, but we'll have more to say on this later. All in all, it is hard to make an argument that the two-point difference is that meaningful here. Okay, so when do we know that a two-unit difference is meaningful? In other words, is there a difference between two groups if that difference is only two units? Let's take a look at an example from the barnyard. Here we have a researcher engaging in powerful and deep explorations of the nature of our world. They are conducting a study to determine if chickens have fewer legs than sheep. And here's the data they've collected. Clearly, this data is far more consistent than the data set from our previous example. And if you note, the more consistent our data, particularly if the sample size gets larger and it remains consistent, the more likely we are to believe that the population is probably consistent. Of course, the average number of legs on all possible chickens is just less than two, but in general, it is rather consistent that most healthy chickens have two legs. Anyone who has had a dog or pet with three or fewer legs understands what I'm getting at here. The point here is that because of the lack of spread in our data, we can confidently conclude that a difference of two units is indeed meaningful in this context, or more specifically with these two populations of sheep and chickens. So let's look at a slightly different version of the juniors and seniors exam scores, where the two points difference is more compelling. And we will see that it is compelling because of the consistency of the values in each data set. We are asking the same question here as before, but I'll describe the question a bit more accurately. Is the difference between the population mean for juniors different from the population mean for the seniors? In our notation, mu sub j represents the population mean for the juniors, and mu sub s represents the population mean for the seniors. Looking at the dot plot for the second version of the data, which will mirror the barnyard example a bit more than the first version of the exam scores, we see that the junior scores cluster more tightly about 74, and the senior scores cluster more tightly about 76. There is still some spread, but we can see the size of the distance between the groups in comparison to the overall amount of spread in each group. And this provides more compelling evidence that there might indeed be a difference in how seniors in general perform on this exam compared to juniors in general. To set the stage for the formal definition of the standard deviation, let's come up with a way to measure the spread of a data set. First, imagine we have planted a milepost on the number line at the value 3. Let me emphasize that there's nothing special about the number 3 here, I just needed to put the milepost somewhere to start this discussion and that's where it ended up. Some might be thinking 7 would be a better choice, and that is indeed the correct type of thinking here, uh, but hold on to that for a moment. Next, we'll measure the distance of each data value to the milepost. Here we get the values 3, 4, 4, 4, and 5. Now, 
find the average of these distances. 3 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 5 is 20, and the average distance from the milepost would be 20 divided by 5, which is 4. So the data here are, on average, 4 units away from the milepost. Again, there was no particularly justifiable reason to put the mile marker at 3, so let's try it at a more commonsensical place. If you had been thinking the mean would be a better place to put the mile marker, well, I would be inclined to agree. Let's place the milepost at 7, the mean of this small toy data set. Here we see that 8 is 1 unit away from the milepost. 6 is also 1 unit away from the milepost, just in the other direction, and the three values of 7 are 0 units away. The sum of these distances from the milepost is 2, and 2 divided by 5 is 0 0.4, and this is the measure of spread for our data. Now, this is just to help us set the stage for the standard deviation. Technically, what we just calculated was not the standard deviation. It is called the mean absolute deviation, where the deviation is a measure of how far a value is from the mean. In other words, the deviation for each value in the data set is defined as the data value less the sample mean, x sub i minus x bar. The deviation for the first value is 6 minus 7, which equals negative 1, and this means 6 is 1 unit below the mean. The deviation for the last value is 8 minus 7, which equals positive 1, which means 8 is 1 unit above the mean. And the absolute value of both of these numbers, i.e. the absolute deviations, are just 1 and 1. The deviation score notes if the value is above or below the mean, but the absolute deviation only marks how far from the mean the value actually is. So you might be thinking, if the deviation score measures a distance, why not just take the average, quote unquote, of the deviation scores? Well, it does make sense to measure and average the distances from a milepost as a measure of spread. But to be clear, the MAD is an average of the absolute deviations, not an average of the actual deviations. And there is a reason we can't use the deviation scores by themselves. This next part of the video explores this concept briefly and involves some mathematical details. If you would like to skip ahead, please jump ahead to timestamp 19 minutes and 50 seconds in the video. It turns out we can't actually use the deviation scores themselves for a measure of spread. Simply put, if you sum them up, they add to zero. And the mean requires the sum, so the mean would always be zero, and a value of zero for every possible data set doesn't do much to help us measure the spread in the data. Let's work through this. We recall that the deviation score of any value in the data set, say x sub i, is the value less the mean, or x sub i minus the mean. We will call this d sub i for the ith deviation score, the deviation score of the ith data value. So if we add all the deviation scores, this means we are adding all the differences from i equals 1 to i equals n. And here we have written out all the differences for this summation notation. Next, we rearrange the values that are being added together and all the values that are being subtracted. In particular, we have all the values x sub 1 through x sub n being added, and then we have n copies of the mean being subtracted. Here we can see that we've rewritten the sum of x sub 1 through x sub n using summation notation. And we can see that we've rewritten the n means as n times the mean, which is being subtracted from the first part of the sum. Now we will recall the definition of the mean. We add all the values in the data set and divide by the number of the data set. And this gives the mean. But if we multiply both sides of the equation by n, the sample size, then we get that the sum of all the values equals n times the sample mean. Plugging this in, we get n times the mean minus n times the mean, which clearly equals zero. And here is the issue. As stated earlier, the deviations always sum to zero. The problem with deviation scores is that if you sum them, they always add to zero. And this is true for any data set. So how do we fix this issue? 
Well, essentially, we want to do something to the deviation scores to make them all positive. Then, when we add or average them, the result won't always be zero. One fix is the one we introduced earlier. We could just take the absolute value of the deviations, the distance from the milepost regardless of direction above or below. If we average the absolute deviations, that gives us the MAD, the mean absolute deviation, which we just calculated. Another approach is that we could square everything. This does indeed make everything positive, or at least non-negative, but this does make everything just a little bit more complicated. However, it turns out mathematically we get a lot of good benefits using this approach. In fact, this formula is called the population variance. It is essentially the average of the squared deviations. But the other issue is that we want to measure spread, and we think of spread over distances, but the units for this measure would be a squared distance, or an area. And we'd rather stick to the units of our data values, not the squared units. So we'll make two tweaks. Instead of taking the average by dividing by n, we're going to tweak it just a bit. We won't divide by n, but by n minus 1, 1 less than the number of the data points. And then because our units will have been squared, we want to have a measure of spread in the same units as our data, so we will undo the square by taking the square root of the final result. And now, finally, we have the formal definition for the sample standard deviation, the measure we will use to describe the spread of the data if our data generally has a bell-shaped distribution. Here's the notation we often use for the standard deviation. Lowercase s for the sample standard deviation, or uppercase Latin script sd. sd is the notation used in APA format, the American Psychological Association Style Guide. So you may see it a lot in psychology, medicine, and other social sciences. Whereas the more mathematical version is just a lowercase s, which is the notation you are likely to see in mathematical, engineering, or economics publications. Again, the process for this calculation is as follows. Take the sum of the squared deviation scores, divide by one less than the sample size, and then take the square root of the final result. This is the formula for the standard deviation from a sample. For the standard deviation for a population, we use the lowercase s in Greek, the letter sigma. It looks like an O with a bit of a tip on the top. You may note two key differences in this formula. First, in the deviations, this formula replaces mu, the population mean, for x bar, the sample mean. Second, here we do indeed divide by the sample size n instead of dividing by n minus 1. This ends our introduction to the standard deviation, its conceptual idea, and the formula to obtain the value. I will end by stating that you do not have to calculate this by hand or at least you shouldn't have to calculate it by hand in any statistics class ever. This is the 21st century, you know. In my courses, my expectation is that students would use some type of technology to calculate the standard deviation and then interpret it correctly. Thanks for your attention. I hope this brief demonstration was useful to you.